the most resilient parasite? An idea. A single idea from the human mind can build cities. An idea can transform the world and rewrite all the rules. Which is why I have to steal it. Never recreate from your memory. Always imagine new places. He's hiding something, and we need to find out what that is. We gotta break out of here. In the kick! This was not a part of the plan! Well, welcome to week two of God in the Movies, as Ben said, and as you can see, today's movie is certainly not for the faint-hearted, but welcome if you're new or newer, or perhaps you're visiting for the first time or watching online, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, My name is Tom, I'm one of the pastors here at E Hills, and today we're going to be unpacking the film Inception. Inception. Now, if you don't know what Inception is, hopefully I'll explain it to you. It is just a kind of a a heads up, It's, it's different from Conception. Um, those are quite different, um, but if you are confused between the two, I know Ben Ramsey would love to have a conversation with you about it and just unpack it for you. Thank you, Ben. That's just getting you back that you weren't in a tutu uh, yesterday. Um, but before we get into the film today, I do just want to take a moment to explain why we're doing a series called God in the Movies. In case you weren't here last week, or maybe you're thinking, you know, why is this guy talking about movies in church? I thought this was all supposed to be about Jesus. Well, just a heads up, it is about Jesus. We are a Jesus church first and foremost, but Jesus loved to use stories or parables to help people understand deeper spiritual truths. He would look around at the world at what was happening in the culture around him, and he would pick up on the narratives or the themes of the day, and he would help people to connect to a deeper message. And in fact, in Matthew 13, the disciples asked Jesus, hey, Jesus, why do you always tell us stories? And he would respond, he says, because it creates readiness in people's hearts and it nudges us towards receptive insights. I said this last week, but stories are powerful. They move us, they inspire us, they teach us. No one has to explain to you the meaning of movies like Braveheart or Gladiator, right? I mean, we just get it. Maybe they'll have to explain Inception to you because that's pretty confusing, but, but not those kinds of movies. We get it. They're about bravery and sacrifice and honor. The stories themselves may not be true, but the lessons always are. And so that's why we do a series like God in the Movies to identify the truth, God's truth, biblical truth, as we see it in the stories of our time. Does that make sense? Okay, so today we're going to be unpacking the truth that we see in the film Inception. And even though we've just watched the trailer, this movie still needs a bit of a setup uh, because it is quite complex. How many of you have actually seen the movie Inception? Oh wow, most of you. Okay, it was a, it was a, it's directed by Christopher Nolan, one of my favorite uh, movie directors. It was a huge film back in 2010. It won four Oscars. It grossed uh, over $900 million. And it is currently rated as the ninth most popular film of all time. Isn't that crazy? Now, some people loved it. Some people hated it. <laughs> Some people just didn't get it, okay? My sister, when I told her that I was gonna be preaching on Inception, she said, well, I hope they don't walk out of your sermon as confused as I did walking out of the cinema, okay? (laughs) And I hope so too, Um, but she's not wrong. In terms of the actual storyline and the plot, Inception is pretty complex, and I'm certainly not gonna try to get into the details of all the, the plot twists. But basically, here's the idea of the film. The idea is that it is possible to enter the dreams of another person in order to steal ideas from their subconscious mind. And that process of stealing an idea is called extraction. 
extraction. And the film tells the tale of the absolute best extractor in the business, Dom Cobb, who's played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his team of people who specialize in accessing people's minds through their dreams when they're at their most vulnerable and stealing or extracting valuable information or secrets from their mind. Now, this has made Cobb, uh, this rare ability has kind of made him a coveted player in the treacherous world of corporate espionage, but it has also made him an international fugitive, and it has cost him everything that he has ever loved. But then Cobb is offered a chance at redemption, one last job that can give him his life back, but only if he and his team accomplish what some consider the impossible. Instead of stealing an idea, he and his team have to pull off the reverse. They have to plant an idea. And this process of planting an idea deep inside someone's subconscious is called inception. As the film tagline says, one small idea planted deep inside of your mind can alter the course of your life. And that's a really important idea that we're gonna come back to. But in order to accomplish this kind of inception in such a way that the dreamer accepts the idea as their own idea, they have to go three levels deep into the dream world. In other words, a dream within a dream within a dream. And time dilates and it gets kind of really weird. So as you can see, this is why the film gets pretty complicated. Because let's be honest, dreams are complicated. Right, dreams are weird sometimes. How many of you just have weird dreams? Okay, awesome. My, I bet you they're not as weird as my wife's dreams, okay? <laughs> my wife has the weirdest dreams. I'm not even gonna tell you something, but she often will wake up and she'll be mad at me, you know this is true, like the whole day. <laughs> because apparently I've done something in the dream that, <laughs> and she holds it against me. I'm like, babe, you can't be cross with dream Tom. You can't be cross with me because of what dream Tom did. <laughs> Am I right? I need some solidarity here. Okay, thank you. Anyway, in the midst of all the kind of amazing visuals and the weirdness and the action and, and all the stuff going on, did you catch the line in the trailer, the opening question that Cobb asks? He says this, what's the most resilient parasite? An idea. And he goes on, he says this, an idea is resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold in the brain, it is almost impossible to eradicate. A person can cover it up, ignore it, but it stays there. An idea that is fully formed, fully understood, can grow to either define you or destroy you. Now, spoiler alert, Cobb only knows that this kind of inception is even possible because he's actually done it before. He had incepted an idea, planted an idea in his wife's mind that ended up destroying her. But really what Cobb is talking about in the film, what this film is about, is this idea of the battlefield of the mind. Say battlefield of the mind. Hey, you're much better than the first service. You guys are awake, okay. But, but, here, but neuroscience backs this up. The truth is that whatever thoughts prevail, good or bad, negative or positive, healthy or unhealthy, these thoughts grow to either define us or to destroy us. Here's the reality. How we think and what we believe is how we will act, always. It has been said, if you believe it or not, it's true. Because when you believe something is true, then you tend to find evidence to support that truth. And that can be a good and a bad thing. But let me give you a little test here. Look around you right now and look for everything that you can see that is, I'll make it easy, red. Okay, you've got a few seconds. Look around you, not just the curtains, that's obvious. Look around, okay, now close your eyes. And I want you to imagine everything that you just saw that was green. <laughs> <laughs> now, probably didn't think of so much green, right? Now, open your eyes again. You can see the red, because obviously that's pretty obvious, because you're looking for red, and there's red everywhere, red around you. But now I want you to look for green. I bet you, you can find a lot more green than you initially. Why? Because you're looking for it. <laughs> and it's the same with our thinking, with our belief. Once you develop a belief, we'll find evidence to support it. And here's my point. If you think you're messed up, if you think you're a failure, 
If you think you're unworthy, then guess what? You're gonna find evidence to support that belief. (laughs) And you will paint yourself in those colors. How we think and what we believe is how we will act. And so much of the Christian walk is about how we think, what we allow, what thoughts we allow into our brain, what we choose to believe about ourselves or about others or about God. Who you believe you are or how you think the world works, it's gonna impact and show up in what you do. It's that internal gear, thinking, believing, feeling, all circling around how you view yourself, your identity, that impacts the outer layers, which are our relationships, our actions, our competencies, and even our results. The results you're getting are a result of the thoughts you're thinking. How you spend your time, how you spend your money, or who or what you place your trust in. Ideas are extremely powerful. The fact that we as a family are here today all the way from South Africa is a result of an idea. (laughs) Now, we believe that's a God idea that was planted in our hearts, a calling from God to, to make our way over here. But it was a sense of calling that, to be honest, over time became impossible to ignore. And the Bible talks so much about the power of our thoughts and the idea, this, this battle that is going on with inside of our minds. Paul, the apostle, he writes a letter to the early church in Rome, and he says this, he says, do not copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. <laughs> then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In Romans chapter seven, Paul writes, he says, I've discovered this principle of life that when I wanna do what is right, I never to be do what is wrong, this wrestle. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. <laughs> this power makes me to a, sl- a slave to the sin that is still within me. And these are just two verses of literally hundreds of verses throughout the scriptures that speak about this battle in our minds, a battle between good and evil, which by the way, doesn't exist between groups of people. The battle between good and evil runs through the heart of every single one of us. A battle between the behaviors and customs of this world and the so often radically different principles of God's kingdom. A battle between our hopes and dreams and sometimes our own destructive thoughts or patterns of thinking or desires. A battle between what is reality and what is the dream, between what is truth and what is a lie. A battle between what we want now and what we want later, (laughs) which is a great definition of discipline, right? I want to look good in the bathing suit summer. I wanna look good in the leotard, I thought anyway, but. but I also wanna eat the donut now. (laughs) And we kinda joke about it, but make no mistake, E-Hills, right now there is a battle for your mind, an assault on your heart and your thoughts from all angles and in every area of your life, your calling, your purpose, your worth, your finances, your relationships, your work. And there are a bunch of us here today who are believing lies and thoughts about ourselves or about God that ultimately left to themselves will destroy us. For some, it may be the belief that you are not good enough, that you'll never be good enough or smart enough or brave enough. For others, you may be believing the lie that you are unwanted or unloved. For some, it may be the belief that there is no hope for you, no hope for your marriage, no hope for your financial situation. Perhaps it's lies that you think about money You think, well, if I can just have a little bit more, then I'll have enough. (laughs) Or when I have enough, then I'll be generous, then I'll be happy. Perhaps you're believing the pervasive lie of guilt, a constant feeling of shame from your past that you cannot shake. Perhaps you've given into the lie of, it's just not that big a deal. I mean, you know, it's just a few drinks. It's just one more fight unresolved. It's just an innocent bit of flirting on iMessage. It's just one more adult website. It doesn't hurt anyone, right? Wrong. Thoughts are powerful. Ideas grow and they grow to define us or to destroy us. 
Guys, I need to make a confession. <laughs> I spoke about messaging on iMessage, and if you've been around for a while, when I arrived in early Jan, I was very public about the fact that I have an Android phone. Thank you. Just wait, just wait, okay. <laughs> I also gave you guys a bit of a hard time about you know, your Americans and your big, ridiculously big trucks with the two wheels at the back and all that. <laughs> so here's my confession. I mean, I have given in. Not only am I the proud owner of an iPhone, but I also bought an American truck. So there we go. So, <laughs> now, it's not big. It's what you guys call mid-size, but in South Africa, that's like a monster truck, okay? So, and to be honest, I'm so disappointed in myself, you know? I crumbled under the peer pressure. I've given in. I've been corrupted by the American system, you know? <laughs> We got people coming back to church now. Well, we left when Tom said he had a Samsung. Now we're back. But anyway. <laughs> but back to the message. Whatever it is for you, whatever lies that, or patterns of thinking that you're wrestling with, I'll tell you this. All these lies do is keep us from experiencing life, the true life, the abundant life that Jesus promises us. And we remain, in a sense, in the dream world, living a false reality. And so if we want to experience this life that God offers to us, it is vital to know what lies we're believing about ourselves and about God. Because how we think and what we believe will always show up in how we act and how we live. And so then the question becomes, what lies are you believing? What lies are you believing? And I know Jess spoke so much about this on the, the women's uh, conference the last year. I didn't even know what her message was, but it feels like God is trying to remind us of something about listening to truth over lies. What thoughts are you allowing to define you or to destroy you? In this next clip, Cobb is training his newest recruit, a gifted and intelligent young girl named Ariadne. And uh, he's training her about how dreams work and how they can shape the dream. And he takes her into her first shared dream experience. But it takes her a while to figure out that she's actually dreaming. Take a look. Well, imagine you're designing a building, right? You consciously create each aspect. But sometimes it feels like it's almost creating itself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah like I'm... Discovering it. Genuine inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in a dream, our mind continuously does this. We create and perceive our world simultaneously, and our mind does this so well that we don't even know what's happening. That allows us to get right in the middle of that process. How? By taking over the creating part. Now, this is where I need you. You create the world of the dream. We bring the subject into that dream, and they fill it with their subconscious. How could I ever acquire enough detail to make them think that it's reality? Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? It's only when we wake up that we realize something is actually strange. Let me ask you a question. You, you never really remember the beginning of a dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. I guess, yeah. So how did we end up here? Well, we just came from the... Uh... Think about it, Ariadne. How did you get here? Where are you right now? We're dreaming. You're actually in the middle of the workshop right now, sleeping. This is your first lesson in shared dreaming. Stay calm. Mm -hmm. full of glass hurts like hell when you're in it, it feels real it's never just a dream when you're in it it feels real you see that's the problem with a dream or in this case a lie so often the lie feels real and we don't even know that it's a lie 
Just like the dream world in that clip, everything looks and feels pretty much the same. It's not like glaringly obvious that you're dreaming. It's only when Cobb points it out to her that she notices. And as I was reflecting on that, I was realizing that's kind of my story. Before I became a follower of Christ, I was living my life blissfully unaware. In fact, from my point of view, life was great. I was crushing my studies. I was a competitive athlete. I was in control, the master of my own destiny, right? <laughs> or so I thought. What I couldn't even realize at the time was that deep down, something was missing. A sinking feeling that there must be more to life than this. More to just seeking out my own happiness or comfort or success. More to life than partying and girls and just making myself look good. But it was only after I asked Jesus to come into my life, or more accurately, when I stepped into his life, that I realized the folly of my ways. That actually I'd been hurting a lot of people, including my future self. That my life was so selfish and self-centered, and that in retrospect, it was all about performance and ego. Anyone else have that story? <laughs> Just me and those two people over there, okay. <laughs> Tough crowd, okay. Christians sometimes talk about being born again, and maybe that language has been you know, messed up a little bit, but that's how it felt for me. It felt like I'd been woken up from a bad dream. As Cobb says in the film, it's only when you wake up to, realize, when you wake up to the truth that you realize that something was strange. The lies we believe, they're sneaky, they're subtle. They've always got an element of truth built into it. That's what makes it so difficult to, to kind of distinguish. And sometimes we don't even know how we end up believing that lie in the first place. It can be something as small and as innocent as an offhand comment from your father when you were a small child and now you live with a constant feeling of inadequacy. Perhaps you find yourself at the table of your marriage or a friendship and somewhere along the line, intimacy or connection has been lost and you can't quite put your finger on when or how it happened, but that's simply where you find yourself. And even though you may even have enough self-awareness to acknowledge the fact that how you're feeling or how you're thinking is a lie, you know, what they said about you or how you see yourself, it still hurts, right? You say, I know the Bible says I'm loved, but to be honest, the feeling of being unloved, the feeling of being lonely and unwanted, it still hurts because it's never just a dream and a face full of glass still hurts. Lies hurt us, they hurt others, and that hurt is very real. Now on the other hand, I'll say this, sometimes we actually choose lies over truth. Sometimes we actually choose. We choose the dream over the reality. And we see this in the film. I won't show you the clip, but there's a scene where they find these dream junkies, these guys that come every day to enter back into the dream world. And one of the characters says, these people come here every day to sleep. And the guy says, he says, no, they come here to be woken up because the dream has now become their reality. And how many of you know people who've defined themselves by a lie? <laughs> Now you might think, well, why would anyone choose a lie over the truth? Well, guess what, E Hills? We do this, I do this, you do this every day. <laughs> we choose, we make choices. We say, well, ignorance is bliss. There are certain things I'd just rather not know about, rather not face up to. I don't wanna know what my teenage daughter's up to. Don't remind me that this relationship is not in a good way or I'm a bad listener. We'll say things like, well, I'm not, I'm not addicted to my phone. You know, I'm just decompressing. This is normal. Don't tell me about the starving kids in Africa or Aurora for that matter. <laughs> just leave me with the illusion that everything is okay. Leave me in my dream world, in my little bubble. I like it here. I know how things work here. You see, as human beings, we have an incredible ability to deceive ourselves. And I get it, sometimes it's just much easier to remain in the dream world to believe a lie than to face up to the truth of the situation. And so we ignore the facts. We, we avoid the pain because we think, we avoid the difficult conversation because we think maybe if I, if I can ignore the truth long enough, it will go away. But here's the deal, the Bible is very clear. You know this already, that ignoring a problem is never productive. 
never in relationships, in, in your finances, in any area of your life, ignoring the truth, it never leads to healing and it never leads to a place of full contentment and joy. It is the truth that sets us free. And so here's my main point, if you get nothing else out of this. Every lie we believe about ourselves or God has a corresponding consequence. Every time we choose to ignore the truth about who God is or who he says we are, we pay a price. Let me give you some examples. If we believe that every time something bad happens to us, it's because God is punishing us, then we'll never learn to trust God as our heavenly father. If we believe that we have to have answers to every question and understand everything about God before we place our trust in Him until there's no mystery left, well, then we'll never be able to have faith or peace. If we believe that God heals all illnesses, then I believe we'll live with a deep-seated sense of disappointment with God when He lets us down. If we believe that we get to heaven based on our own merit, then we will spend our life running around trying to figure out how good is good enough And we'll be deeply disappointed at the end of our lives when we realize it was never about what we do and always about what Christ has already done for us. Amen? Amen. And if we believe that there are things in our lives that God simply, that are just too terrible, that God simply could never forgive us, then we will never be able to receive forgiveness and we will live with a constant feeling of guilt and shame. Every lie we believe about ourselves or about God has a corresponding consequence. A small idea will grow to either define you or destroy you. You still with me? So what do we do from here? How then do we tell the difference between truth and lie, between what is a dream and what is reality? Well, this next clip gives us some clues. Ariadne is now spending more time in the dream world, learning how to shape and create the dream. But as she goes deeper and deeper, she begins to lose touch with reality and confuses her dreams with her memory. And Cobb knows how dangerous that can be. And so he tries to warn her. And then later in the clip, uh, Ariadne actually figures out that there is in fact a way, a simple way to tell the truth from the lie. So as you watch this next clip, don't be distracted by the visuals or the strangeness of the dreams or the violence. Just listen to the dialogue, especially the advice given by one of the other extractors, a guy by the name of Arthur. Take a look. this bridge. This place is real, isn't it? Yeah, I cross it every day to get to the college. Never recreate places from your memory. Always imagine new places. Well, you gotta draw from stuff you know, right? Only use details, uh, a, a street lamp or a phone booth, never entire areas. Why not? Because building a dream from your memory is the easiest way to lose your grasp on what's real and what is a dream. Is that what happened to you? Listen, this has nothing to do with me, understand? Is that why you need me to build your dreams? Get off of me. Back up. Hey, back up! Whoa! Get off! Whoa! Let me go! Whoa! Let me go! Oh! Whoa! Wake me up! Still some time on the clock. You can't wake up from within the dream unless you die. She'll need a totem. What? A totem. It's a small person. That's some subconscious you've got on you, Cobb. She's a real charmer. Oh, I see you met Mrs. Cobb. She's his wife? Yeah. So a totem. 
You need a small object, potentially heavy, something you can have on you all the time that no one else like knows. Like a coin? No, it needs to be more unique than that. Like, this is a loaded die. I can't let you touch it, that would defeat the purpose. See, only I know the balance and the weight of this particular loaded die. That way, when you look at your totem, you know beyond a doubt that you're not in someone else's dream. I, I, I don't know if, if you can't see what's going on or if you just don't want to, but Cobb has some serious problems that he's tried to bury down there, and I'm not about to just open my mind to someone like that. I don't know if you can't see what's going on, or if you just don't want to. Ariadne is beginning to understand how easy it is for us to ignore the truth in our lives, to bury it. And maybe you felt or feel like she did in that clip, that feeling that life seems to be turning on you, that all the negative thoughts and the doubts and the lies that you've believed seem to be converging on you, making you fearful, making you lose faith, making you wanna scream, God, wake me up, wake me up. Now, in the midst of all that is going on in that scene, it's easy to miss Arthur's advice. And this advice really is the key. It's the key to this film, and it's the key to my message today. Arthur tells Ariadna that there is, in fact, a way to tell the difference between dream and reality, between truth and lies. And he introduces her to a thing called a totem. It's a small, potentially heavy object, something that has weight and balance and movement that you can become familiar with as you handle it and examine it so that you know beyond a doubt that you're not dreaming. For Arthur, it's a loaded dice. For Cobb, it's a spinning top. And in the dream world, the top never stops spinning. And so if it topples, Cobb knows that he's awake. It's how he tells the difference. And I just love this idea of a totem or what I wanna call today an anchor. Say anchor. How do you say anchor, 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 anchor? It doesn't have an E in it, anyway. Okay, it does have an R, I suppose, so anchor. Anyway, but, but this is a simple and ingenious solution, some kind of objective reality outside of one's own subjective experience, outside of how we might feel or our emotions at any given point in time, because how many of you know sometimes our emotions lie? <laughs> a way to measure what is real and what is not. And I think in this postmodern world where truth is kind of subjective, in a world that says truth is whatever you make it, it's relative, or just live your truth, some sort of anchor like this is so important for us to help us stay grounded in God reality. And so what are the anchors for Christ followers? Well, what are those things that help us to stay grounded in reality? Well, there are many. Community helps us stay grounded. Communion, baptism, the sacraments that have been practiced by Christians for thousands of years, serving, prayer, historical tradition, well, at least some of it. But today I wanna talk about two specific anchors that I think can help us to judge what is true and what is not. And the first is this, scripture. Say scripture. The Bible, God's Word, whatever you wanna call it. Now, personally, I like the word Scripture because I feel like the Bible has kind of been, you know, weaponized in today's culture, where, where people use the Bible as a weapon, pulling out selective passages to prove a point or get their own way, and that is certainly not how the Bible was intended to be used. But having said all that, the simple truth is this. If you wanna tell the truth from a lie, you have to read the Scriptures. We have to know how it feels, its movement, its trajectory, its context, the overarching narrative of the Bible. We have to become familiar with it. Now, if you're new to church, maybe this is your first time or you're checking us out or watching online, you're probably thinking, ha, I knew the preacher was gonna tell me to read my Bible. <laughs> I mean, so obvious. I mean, come on, can't you come up with something new? You know what I mean? And maybe if you've been to church for you know, years, you've probably heard a thousand times the preacher say, read your Bible maybe even with a tinge of guilt kind of thrown in there. And my heart is certainly not to induce guilt, but if we're honest, for those of us who call ourselves followers of Christ, how often are we actually regularly engaging with our scripture, with the Bible? And I'll be the first to admit that I don't always get this right. I know I'm a pastor, I'm not supposed to say that, but it's true. <laughs> You know, when we had, when our boys were still very small, we had two small toddlers, and people would look at me and they would speak about their quiet time, 
And I just look at them with my, you know, sleep deprived eyes just going, what is this quiet time you speak of? You know what I mean? Like we have two Tasmanian devils over there and you know that scene where stuff's like exploding, you know, like in the street. That's like how my kids get home from school with their bags. Just like <laughs> Love you boys. Okay. <laughs> And so over the years, my engagement with Scripture has ebbed and flowed in different seasons. Sometimes I found great rhythm in waking up early before anyone else and reading the Bible, you know, a physical Bible. Other times I listen to the audio Bible in the car on the way to work. Um, At the moment, I'm really enjoying kind of diving into the YouVersion Bible app, which is free, and it gives you, you know, daily Scripture verses, and you can read uh, reading plans or like the Bible in one year. Um, E Hills is right now doing a, a, the, the Psalms in a year, which I'm really enjoying. And you can pick up one of those little cards on your way out that helps guide you through it. The point is, it's actually not about how often or how much or when you read. You don't read, we don't read the Bible to earn brownie points with God, right? <laughs> it's about letting it rest in our hearts and sink into our souls. And you guys know this already, but sometimes life has a way of blindsiding us. Sweeping us off our feet, a tragedy or an event we didn't anticipate or or, or something. And without being rooted in God's word, we become like a ship at sea without a compass or any sense of direction. Getting tossed back and forth by the storms of life without some sort of reference point. There's nothing to anchor or tether our thoughts to. And so our minds become fertile ground for all kinds of bad stuff to grow. Self-doubt, insecurities, fears, self-righteousness. When we don't spend time with the anchor of Scripture, it's easy to lose touch with what is real and think that our little worlds are the world. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 10 says this, we are human, but we do not wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds, say strongholds, of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture these rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Now, if you don't know what that kind of means, what that looks like, I think in picture, so we had the team kind of draw this this image up which helps kind of explain what Paul is trying to say here. First of all, he says we are human In other words, you cannot stop ideas from coming into your mind. That's very natural. I wanna kill my boss or whatever, you know, like you can't stop that thought coming, but, but what we can do is have a choice in what we do with those thoughts. And what Paul is compelling us to do here is to destroy or take captive every negative thought, every false argument and make it obedient to Christ. In other words, to align our thinking with God's thinking. And when we do that, when we do that repeatedly, then what happens is we we begin, instead of having strongholds in our lives, we actually build up positive arguments from God's word, what God says, and actually we begin to form a fortress of the mind that becomes resilient to further lies. Does this make sense? Here's the deal though, this takes practice. This takes intentionality, it takes time, it takes faith, and it takes knowing God's word. Now, before I move on to the, lo- to the second anchor, I just wanna get real practical here and double click here a little bit because if you struggle with reading the Bible or you're not really sure where to start, let me just give you two quick tips. The first is get a good version, one that you can actually understand. The King James Version is great, but unless you speak with these and thous in your everyday life, it's not really gonna make sense, Right? We think it's you know, oh, very spiritual. My wife loves pride and prejudice, but even she doesn't talk like Elizabeth Bennett to me, okay? <laughs> Thomas, is it not general incivility, the very essence of love? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I love it, you know what I mean? I love old school language, I get into it. When I go to concerts, people are like, yeah, woohoo. I just throw in like a hip, hip, hooray, you know? Um, <laughs> just to keep it old school. But, I like the New Living Translation or the, the, the New International Version, but really that's up to you. Almost all biblical translations are translated from the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. They're all working off the same texts. And, and if you don't have a Bible, then we would love to give you one. There's Bibles, grab one on your way out. There's tools like you version. Honestly, in a world where there are still many countries in the world where it is illegal to have a Bible, 
In the US, we have no excuse because we have so much access to the scriptures these days. So get a good version. Second, create some space. The goal, according to the scriptures, is that we would have the word of God on our lips and in our hearts all the time, everywhere. But in order for that to become true, then we have to read it sometime, somewhere. And so for many, that might might be the first thing in the morning that works well for people. For others, that may feel like torture. Like I said, it doesn't matter really where or when or how long. What matters is building it into your daily routine, into your daily rhythm. And if five minutes is all you can handle, then five minutes is better than zero minutes, right? It's never gonna be easy. It's never gonna be convenient, but it will be worth it. And so I encourage you, challenge you to make the sacrifice and watch how God uses it, amen? Okay, second anchor, I'm almost done. Second anchor that helps us to stay grounded to God reality is the cross. Scripture and the cross, say the cross. Paul talks about this in Hebrews 6 verse 19, talking about the power of what Christ did on the cross and he says this, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for your souls. The message translation says this, it is an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very essence, the very presence of God. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab this promised hope with both hands and never let go. You see, the cross is our ultimate anchor to truth. It's why so many people wear crosses around their necks, right? It's why people tattoo crosses on their bodies. It's the ultimate totem, the ultimate reminder. It's funny when people see my my tattoo sleeve, they'll say things like, oh, it's amazing how God just rescued you from a life of sin. (laughs) And I don't have the heart to tell them, actually I got all these tattoos after I became a Christian. But anyway, (laughs) but you see the cross, is an anchor reminding us, reminding you that whenever things get messy, when we lose touch with what is real and what is a lie, when what we feel and what we know don't always align, then we must look to the cross because it is on the cross that everything is put into perspective where we are reminded of what Christ did for us. We we remember that God loves us so much that He would be willing to go to such extreme lengths that we might break free from the strongholds that seek to imprison us. In the movie Inception, they talk about the kick. It's that feeling you have of falling when you're you're sort of sleeping and you wake up. You know that feeling? You do it on an airplane, you punch the person next to them. (laughs) But in a sense, the cross is the Christian's kick. The reminder that Jesus came to wake us up and to kick us back through all the layers of of lies back to the truth, that one simple truth, that God loves you. (laughs) For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That one simple truth that Jesus incepted into our world That one simple truth that spread like wildfire in the ancient world, highly contagious, highly resilient. That one simple truth that can build cities, transform the world and rewrite all the rules. That one truth that can and will change your life. Amen. E Hills, let me remind you today that the enemy knows your name but calls you by your sin. But God knows your sin and calls you by your name. And if you have forgotten E Hills, if you've forgotten who God says you are, and I know the woman, we're looking at this all weekend, but maybe God is trying to remind us of who He says you are, and this is who He says you are. You are courageous. You are accepted. You are rescued. You are never alone. You are valuable. You are chosen. You are loved. You are a new creation. You are free. You are endowed with purpose. You are treasured. You are precious. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a masterpiece. You are enough and you are a child of God. So let's stand and declare those truths today.